I think it is pretty safe to say that the WWE is not going to have any fans at the 2021 Royal Rumble at Tropicana Field inside the WWE Thunderdome. Now, that's very disappointing to me. I'm sure it's very disappointing to you guys as well. But it's something that we're just going to have to live with right now. I don't want WWE to go and change anything else about what's going to happen at the Royal Rumble. But now we're reading rumors that WWE is going to alter the way that they book and plan for the Royal Rumble now that there's not going to be any fans inside Tropicana Field. What does this mean? Why would you go and alter the Royal Rumble? I hope to God they don't change anything to fit the current agenda and to fit the current narrative of there not being live human beings in attendance. Also, we will talk about Ricochet and Matt Riddle and their contract statuses with the WWE. Who's staying? Who's going? Why should they stay? Why should they go? Or is it all complete BS? We're going to go over all of that because it was a top story in the community this week. And the big one, folks. It's not the major story for today's show, but it's a big one nonetheless. I am sick and tired of talking about why Charlotte Flair is not the greatest of all time. I think if anybody has a proper working functioning brain, you know that Charlotte Flair is nowhere near the best female performer in the entire world. Some people are actually out there saying she's the greatest of all time. How could you possibly go and admit that to anybody? I don't understand that line of thinking. Bubba Ray, Bully Ray, whatever you want to call him nowadays, went on his podcast and blasted all of the fans who talk down and complain about Charlotte Flair, all while pushing this tired and just boring narrative, this repeated narrative about Charlotte Flair being the greatest of all time. Let me tell you something, Mr. Ray, she's not, and nowhere even close to being the greatest of all time. We're gonna talk about this and so much more right here on episode 360 of Off The Scripts. going on guys thank you so very much for joining me right here on off the script this is episode 360 for your saturday january 16th 2021 we have a lot to get into today i got a couple of surprises along the way should be another great episode of off the script not a lot happening in the world of pro wrestling in the world of wwe outside of the norm you would figure with the Royal Rumble coming up that we have a lot more news and rumors per se circulating around who's going to win and who's the favorite and what WWE has planned, where they're going into WrestleMania, what ideas they got. We got nothing. We got absolutely nothing. And it's not because it's just a slow week for the sake of being a slow week. It's a slow week, it's a slow time because of the one thing that I complain about all the time. And that is the fact that WWE has absolutely no idea what the hell they are doing. It's not our fault. It's not Meltzer's fault. It's not Alvarez's fault. It's not PW Insider's fault. Where's the news? Blame Bruce. 
Blame Vince. They got absolutely nothing. Nothing planned. I guarantee you they don't have anything planned for the Royal Rumble outside of what was already announced and what has been teased on Monday and Friday night, which is sad, which is sad. This may be, and I think I said the same thing last year, this may be the slowest Royal Rumble season of all time. And that's not good. That's not good at all. But I got something for you guys today, man. We're going to talk about Ricochet. We're going to talk about Matt Riddle. We're going to talk about my good old buddy T-Bag and Retribution and the shit contracts that they were given. We're going to talk about Jay White. There's an update on Jay White if he's coming to the WWE, if he's staying in New Japan. Who gives a shit at this point? I know I don't. I don't know why anybody would want him in WWE. You must not be a Jay White fan. You know what happens when an outsider comes to the WWE. Jay White? Who's that? You think Vince knows who Jay White is? Give me a break, man. Give me a break. Also got news on WWE having this new show, India's Superstar Spectacle. Quite the spectacle it is, folks. And I mean that in the most unenthusiastic way possible. There you go. Is Jinder Mahal going to be a part of the show? I couldn't give a shit. Also news on Royal Rumble fans, an update on that. WWE, as I said at the top, discussing changing the concept of the Royal Rumble, whatever the fuck that means. Why change a good thing? I don't understand it. Here's a fucking better point I think WWE should be making. Why don't you go out there and book a damn good Royal Rumble match instead of trying to change things to fit current narratives? Simple. WrestleMania 37, Royal Rumble might not be the only thing getting changed. WrestleMania 37 may be moved. Venue and date may be moved. I got news on that. And then Charlotte Flair not happy with a specific column looking at the heat she receives online by fans. Oh, maybe they didn't update her database with uh, crying emojis. Give me a break. Charlotte, uh, listen, I am so sick and tired of this shit. I I don't even know. I don't even want to physically emit any emotion talking about this news article. I want to specifically talk about what Bully Ray, Mr. Ray, said on Busted Open Radio in regards to us. Because everybody that works in the WWE looks down on the fans. And if you're a fan, you have no business on speaking of things because you don't work for said WWE. Give me a break. Just another shill looking for a WWE rubbing of the elbow moment. Mr. Ray. And then obviously news from Raw. I got news on Drew McIntyre's coronavirus update. Got news coming from SmackDown. Got news coming from NXT and AEW. And a big story here that might have been overlooked in the grand scheme of things this week. Mustafa Ali might actually have heat in the WWE locker room for mentioning something so ridiculous that you're going to laugh when I tell you what it is. Just goes to show you, and I mean this, goes to show you how petty WWE can be. Thank you guys so much for joining me here on the podcast, man. Episode 360, we got a lot to go over, like I said. Follow me on Twitter, at JD from NY206. Twitter and Instagram is the hot spots if you want to keep up to date on everything on the channel. Twitter's where I mainly reside, but... You know how Twitter is nowadays, man, censoring and just cutting off free speech and all that nonsense. So who knows what's going on with that? I'll be there until the ship goes down. But that's the main place where you can find me on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then obviously for the Royal Rumble coming up on January 31st. So make sure you guys are following me on social media. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206 if you want to support the podcast via Patreon. Sent out some 
off the script insignia cookies to some lucky folk. And we got those baseball bat beer mugs that are exclusively only on Patreon. So if you guys want to go and check that stuff out, t-shirts as well. We got the official Are You Live or Are We Live t-shirt on Patreon. So go and sign up for those two tiers. Tier one gets you the t-shirt. Tier two gets you the t-shirt and the mug and a cookie. So make sure you guys go and check. And the cookies, by the way, you're probably asking a fucking off the script cookie. Yeah. Baked by one of the most esteemed bakeries in New York City. So make sure you guys go check it out, man. We got a lot of cool stuff on the Patreon page. Patreon.com slash JD from NY 206. We got masks. Mouthmasker.com slash OTS for your off the script face coverings. We got the t-shirts. As always, bonfire.com is the exclusive home of JD's t-shirts for the podcast, Off the Script. And today's show is sponsored by my great friends over at Blue Chew. Because I don't want you guys to suffer anymore on Monday night. Or actually, let me rephrase that. I don't want your wives or your girlfriends suffering anymore on Monday night. Because Bruce and the android are leaving you unmotivated on Monday night. BlueChew.com, and that is code JD at checkout for your free sample of BlueChew. BlueChew.com, always a great sponsor of the show right here on Off The Script. And if you missed any of the live streams that I did this week, man, we had a mega week for the live streams. Monday Night Raw, AEW Dynamite. That was New Year's Smash Night 2 on Wednesday night. And then we got, obviously, SmackDown last night. Go and check all that stuff out. Links will be down in the description below for all your appropriate playlists. So go and check all that stuff out. Going to start at the top, man. I want to start off with this Ricochet news because it's been circulating in and around the community as far as where he's going and what he's doing and what his contract status may be. Now, A lot of people tend to reach into my private messages or my Twitter feed and they ask me, JD, how come you're not covering this? Are you going to cover this? Are you going to cover that? What are your thoughts on this? Immediately, when a news article breaks, I've always been the type of guy to wait because there's always 10 times out of 10, always something else that is added to said story. Or there's something that might be fake or false and it might not be completely true. You hear one thing one day and then it's completely debunked the next day. And then people are asking me, well, why didn't you cover it? Because it's not really all that important. And more than likely what you heard on the day that you heard it is not going to be the same a couple of days later. This is why I never, unless it's something major. Unless it is absolutely something catastrophic where Roman Reigns fucking just gets a debilitating injury and he's out for like 12 months and he's going to drop the universal. That's something. That's something that I would actually go out there, stop what I'm doing, cover, let you guys know in video form and give my quick thoughts on that. And then we'll cover it more in depth as the week goes on. But this is why I don't listen to Wrestle Geeks or any of these other channels in the community, unless it's from a reliable source. Because all that does is show that, A, you're unprofessional. B, you're just in it for the clicks and the views and the blah, 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 blah on YouTube. And that's it. That's it. It actually ruins your credibility. I am not like that. I would rather wait and cover it because I know that everybody's going to want to hear my opinion anyway. That's why I didn't cover Ricochet leaving. Everybody was like, oh, his contract is up in January this month. He's going to eight, He's going to go to AEW. He can show up on Dynamite as soon as his contract is up in a couple of weeks. So everybody was under the impression that Ricochet's contract was up. Now, there's an update to this situation because Brian Alvarez brought up Ricochet's booking on Wrestling Observer Live. He mentioned Ricochet's contract while talking about his booking. Now, he was buried by retribution. The last time we seen him, he was losing 
to Retribution. I believe he lost to Ali. And he lost to uh, T-Bag over there. Want to be Slipknot, Corey Taylor, Dominic Dijakovic. He also mentioned Ricochet's contract while talking about his booking and the belief that Ricochet has yet to sign a new deal with World Wrestling Entertainment. Ricochet's contract, says Alvarez, could be running up sooner rather than later. And he reportedly signed a three-year deal in 2018. Now, that is something that I had also assumed as well. His deal is up sometime this year unless he inked a new contract, says the report. Now, WWE, I didn't know that they went ahead and did this or this was a protocol by World Wrestling Entertainment, but if you were called up from NXT and obviously with the pandemic going on, you know, one person's line of thinking is going to be obviously leading towards, I got to take care of my family. I need as much security now than ever before because I don't know what the hell is going to happen. So I'm going to take the safe route now and then make sure everybody's comfortable instead of taking the perilous route where there's twists and turns and just uh, a whole bunch of uncertainty. Now, I had no idea WWE would bring somebody up from NXT and then give them the option to re-up their contract and sign a brand new contract for five years. That's apparently what happened with a bunch of NXT talent. Everybody in retribution. Ricochet. Matt Riddle was probably given that option as well. Even him, we heard, signed a new contract or at least was about to ink a new contract. Now that's come out this week and nobody knows if or he did not sign a new contract. Now with Ricochet... He did show up in WWE around January of 2018. That would give the three years to Ricochet, and his contract would be up this year. But Meltzer uh, previously talked about this on the Wrestling Observer Live and noted that his contract expires in summer of 2024. So he's not going anywhere. He's not leaving the WWE. He is bound to this prison for another three years. It was noted that he signed a five-year deal when he moved to the main roster. This was at a time when WWE was trying to prevent talents from signing with AEW and locking down wrestlers to big money five-year deals. So this was well before the pandemic. Nobody knew there was going to be a pandemic. Ricochet made his main roster debut in February of 2019 after a semi-successful run. Anything is successful compared to the main roster in NXT. Ricochet hasn't been featured on Raw since dropping a loss to Mustafa Ali on December 28th on Raw. He was backstage this past Monday night, but not used. I got news on that as well following Drew McIntyre's positive COVID-19 test. He did score a win over Drew Gulak. If you guys care to know, on Thursday's WWE main event episode on the network. So Ricochet is bound to this WWE prison till 2024, folks. I think we can put all of this to bed now. He's not going anywhere. He's not going to New Japan. He's not going to AEW. He's not teaming with Matt Seidel in AEW. He's not going after Kenny Omega. We're not going to see dream matches over on Wednesday night on TNT featuring Rick O'Shea. It's not going to happen. And it's sad. I know. It's very sad that it's not going to happen because this guy's career is in shambles and it's going downhill even further Compared to where he was in NXT, I don't think he ever realized it was going to be this bad. Or maybe he did and he didn't fucking care. But the reason why we are so interested in shit like this and the reason why people get this type of news and information wrong and put something out that's not true is because we care. We care. We don't want him there anymore. Which... I mean, as a fan, from an outsider's perspective looking in, it's unfair because you're not going to tell Ricochet how much money he's going to 
want to make, or you can't dictate how much money he's going to make in WWE or anywhere, really. For you to sit there and say, oh, I think you should go somewhere else. Meanwhile, he may think at this point in his life, I busted my ass to fucking get here. I'm going to take whatever they give me because I deserve this, and I don't really give a shit about how they creatively book me on Monday Night Raw. All I know is the guy deserves a lot better. All I know is the guy had one of the worst 2020s of all time ever. For a guy so promising, the guy had a miserable year. And I still will never forget how people argue with me. Oh, but why are you saying he's buried? He's got a WWE title match against Brock Lesnar in Saudi Arabia. How good did that end up? He got no offense in 90 seconds. And then what happened to him for the rest of the year? Did WWE maybe hint at giving him money in the bank? Of course not. Did WWE do anything with Ricochet? No. They feuded him with the fucking Hurt Business for about six months. And then after all of that and about 67 fucking matches repeated on Monday night, then they want to have him feud with Retribution and tease his inclusion joining that group, which I don't know would be, I don't know which one's a bigger failure, Ricochet's WWE run or Retribution. The guy's not going anywhere. The guy's not going anywhere. He's dead. The amount of time WWE needs to resuscitate this guy's career may take all of his contract. It may take longer than the contract he is currently inked to in WWE. That's how bad they fucked him up. Finn Balor got to move back down to NXT. This guy and Aleister Black may be Andrade. Send them all back down there. You know what? If that was the case, I may actually tune in on Wednesday nights. Because when they were there, NXT was fucking great. NXT was great. They also had Mauro Ronaldo, But that's a completely different story. He needs a move back down to NXT. This guy needs a time to unwind and get away from this disease. That right now is plaguing him on Monday nights. But they won't move him down there. If they move him down there, then Vince is admitting failure. Vince doesn't want somebody that he took from Triple H. And now he has possession of on the main roster to go back down to NXT. That's only going to show that Triple H does his job better than Vince. Nobody wants that. The reason why Aleister Black didn't get moved back down there when we all know he should be down there. Would you rather risk losing them? Or do you want them to stay? And maybe you'll look at them a little bit differently. Ricochet's going nowhere, which is sad. This guy should be a future WWE champion. But right now, he's nothing more than WWE's favorite catering entity on Monday night. Matt Riddle. Matt Riddle may not have signed the new WWE contract. You don't say. You don't say. Last month, there were reports stating that Matt Riddle signed a new long-term contract to stay with the WWE. Since the news broke, there has been nothing to indicate that the company plans to give him a serious push. In fact, if you watch Monday Night Raw, Bobby Lashley absolutely buried. Now, I don't like throwing that word around. I know a lot of people tend to turn their, uh, their ears away when they hear the word buried when describing a WWE talent. I get, if you watch Raw, Lashley attacked Matt Riddle before the bell. I get it. But the, fa- the fact of the matter is, Matt Riddle lost in two minutes. You booked the WWE United States Championship match to have him lose in two minutes. And that was after the previous week where You booked Bobby Lashley to lose via a fuck finish. And Lashley was the most protected superstar on the entire brand outside of Drew McIntyre. Now, that didn't make any sense whatsoever. For you to do that and then turn around and have him squash Matt Riddle in two minutes, no matter if he was attacked before the bell or not, is absolutely shit creative, 
It really is. Now, I don't know how WWE is going to swindle this match again at the Royal Rumble. At this point, I don't care. Because Matt Riddle already looks like a fucking loser. He's nothing more than a comedy geek on Monday night. Bro, I'm going to sit here and talk about pizza, bro. I don't know whether I want pepperoni, bro, or sausage, bro. Maybe Canadian bacon, bro. How about pineapple, bro? Or emitting all these emotions, bro, 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 bro. I could do it too. I'm from fucking New York, man. I'm from the fucking Bronx. Bro is in my everyday vocabulary. This is what they resulted, or this is what has resulted, I should say, in Matt Riddle's main roster run, quote unquote. Now, again, we as fans should not be dictating how much money said superstar should be making and where they should be making that said money. It's not fair. We don't have any say in that. They're going to do what is best for them. If they want to bypass creative freedom, then by all means, make your fucking sinful blood money and ruin your fucking career while you sit there in handcuffs and then block everybody on social media because everybody thinks you deserve better. That's the way of the world, man. These guys, these wrestlers, these men and women, sensitive. When we are actually on their side wanting better for them, they turn it around and blame us. Like we're the fucking enemy, like we're the bad guy, like we don't know what the fuck we're talking about. All we want is for you to be booked the way you should be booked because we appreciate you. We want to see you succeed, not sit there in a fucking doldrum, in some dungeon somewhere, fucking being watched by Bruce Pritchard. Maybe you get a half a fucking meal a day, man. I don't fucking know. Knowing Bruce, he may torture you. Just because that's exactly what gets his fucking rocks off. Bruce Pritchard. Now, we don't know where Riddle's going. Since the news broke, there's been nothing to indicate what's going on. We're really lost to Bobby Lashley. The booking of Riddle could have nothing to do with him signing or not signing a contract. It may have everything to do with him signing or not signing a contract. I don't know. But Brian Alvarez made note of this on Wrestling Observer Live this week. Alvarez said, and I quote, remember when they offered him a new deal? I don't think he signed yet. Just want to throw that out there. Now that's just Brian Alvarez giving his opinion. He also said the same thing about Ricochet. He said the same thing legitimately about Ricochet. His contract may be up soon. Sooner rather than later, he may be out of the WWE. So if he was wrong on Ricochet, he could absolutely be wrong on Matt Riddle. We, we don't know. We don't know what's going on with any of these guys. Until we have somebody come out here and say, this is what it is. That type of information really is not known to a lot of people. And it really is nobody's business how much money somebody makes and how many years they're signed with said company. But Matt Riddle, listen, if Matt Riddle wants to stay with with the company, then by all means, stay with the company. I think, honestly, he's reached his peak. I think he's reached his ceiling in the eyes of WWE. Has he reached his potential with me and you? No. You might not be a fan of Matt Riddle. WWE, the way they treated Matt Riddle so far on the main roster, he may actually look worse to some of those people that did not like him already. I still see money in Matt Riddle. I still see money to be made with Matt Riddle. I still see a future megastar in Matt Riddle. It's all up to him if he wants to get to that point and work at it, or he's just going to be one of these guys like Ricochet that made it to the WWE and he wants to get complacent because they're taking care of him on the back end. But meanwhile, on TV, he's nothing more than a comedy geek. So again, this is something that we're going to have to wait and see how it develops. We don't know where he's going. He may or may not be going anywhere. I don't know yet. Speaking of contracts, this was actually reported by Fightful Select and Sean Ross Sapp. With all this contract talk with Matt Riddle and Ricochet, Fightful has recently suggested that the news about these current contracts with Ricochet and Matt Riddle, this all led 
to them talking about teabag and mace, slap nuts, slap dick, slap jock, and reckoning. Apparently, they all signed in the fall of last year. Now, the details of these new contract offers suggests the numbers are around $250,000 per year. Now, Ali's deal was separate from the group. He was already inked to a main roster deal. We don't know when his contract is due up, which means WWE is invested into the faction for more than $1 million per year. Now, if you are wrestling one day a week and you're slapjack in retribution, that might be enough money for you. Most of these men and women live in the greater Orlando area, Tampa, Orlando, wherever, right? So they're based solely in the same city in which WWE produces their weekly shows. So they go to the venue, they do their work, they do their job, and then they go home. There's no travel required, there's no hotel, there's no strenuous amount of time on the road, driving from city to city, venue to venue. $250,000 to Shane Thorne, a.k.a. Slap Dick, who came up from NXT that was probably making $75,000 a year in NXT to do nothing, bust his ass probably more than he did on the main roster, That may seem like a lot of money to him. That's a major upgrade, a major promotion for someone like Slapjack. I don't know how much Dominic Dijakovic was making. I don't know how much Dio Madden was making. Can't be much. $75,000 maybe for those PC talents. Mia Yim, maybe $100,000. They all got generous raises to be on the main roster. That does not mean that they are successful. That just means WWE didn't want them to go anywhere else. So they shelled out enough money for them to say yes while they sat them down to ink a new deal. Five years with Dijakovic, Mace, Slapjack, and Mia Yim. So they are done for. If WWE has no plans for them now, if this is the best that they have for a Mia Yim or a Dominic Dijakovic, What do you think the next four and a half years are going to be? Trash. They have absolutely ruined their entire careers because this is what they're going to be synonymous with. Retribution and the failure that is the group and the way that they've been creatively booked on Monday Night Raw. Absolutely nothing about what their vision was for retribution with what they said, what their mission statement was, is the same now. They're nothing more than a fucking time filler on Monday night. All right, we need six minutes. Yeah, let's throw Slapjack in there. We need eight minutes. Let's throw Dominic Dijakovic, teabag, in there. Give me a break. And this is somebody that I actually had mega high hopes for because Dominic Dijakovic is a damn good fucking wrestler. And he doesn't deserve that type of shit. He may think that he's living the high life now. He may be one of those guys that conformed. Oh, you can't talk about the the, the company that I work for in that manner. You can't talk bad about them. I don't know how many people he's blocked on social media, including myself. All I did was say, hey, bro, when's the new album drop? And when's the new single drop? And I can't wait to hear it. Blocked. They don't give a fuck who supports them and who doesn't support them. They're making their money. They're doing their thing. You're a fan. Stay in your lane. Fuck off. You don't understand anything. That's their mentality. I've lost major respect for the majority of that locker room. Retribution got low ball offers. Now you have to pay the ultimate price. Slavery to Bruce Pritchard and Vince McMahon. Now, while these deals are lower, Fightful also notes that some of the NXT call-ups have been told that when fans can return... The contract offers should increase. Yeah, sure thing. Just like our WWE furloughed a bunch of people and then told them, yeah, yeah, we're we not bringing you back. Goodbye. Sure. Just to give hope to those that signed these new deals. Oh, look, more money should be coming to us. Do they deserve more money? No. It's not all negative, but that's what they said. Using NXT members on lower-end contracts could have been a real win for WWE. 
if the Retribution group would have resonated with the fans, if there were actual live human beings in there, who knows how they might be treated by the actual audience? They may be mega over, but we don't know. WWE pushes who they want. They get over who they want. They bury who they want because at the flip of a fucking switch, they could give you crowd enhancements and they could take away with what they got with the piped in crowd noise, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. So nobody knows how truly over anybody is. Somebody that you think should be over, (laughs) Keith Lee, he may be mega over. And I'll talk about that seriously. Him, he's the biggest example. Matt Riddle's another one. He's another example. Two of the biggest examples that could be more over if WWE actually wanted them to be over in the middle of this pandemic with the piped-in audience. Retribution members might be kicking themselves in the end. Who knows? They may be happy. They may be kicking themselves in the end. Who the fuck knows? Reports are that a number of other superstars have declined contracts from WWE because of how much lower all the extensions were. Had the group known that they'd be spinning in circles like this and being booked creatively terrible like this, they might have not signed new deals with WWE. We don't know. Now, some of those people might not have signed because they want to see what happens with the pandemic, if there's actually a touring brand again in WWE, if there's paying people to come to these shows again. Nobody knows. They're not making anything additional on top of their downside guarantee. So we'll have to see what happens. Those people that did not sign, they're waiting to see if things get better. Some of those people just didn't sign because they don't want to sign and they don't want to return. Those are the people I'm most curious in. Who were those names? And why haven't they signed? They think we all know, but those are the names I'm most interested in. So this is all the contract news. Ricochet ain't going anywhere. Matt Riddle's a big question mark. He may have signed. He may not have signed. Retribution is in deep for five years. So that's that. Any more questions? I'll let you guys know when I hear something new on anybody else that did not sign those deals and does not want to return to WWE. Major update on Jay White to WWE. These rumors are still circulating in and around the community. Speaking on the latest Observer Radio, Meltzer revealed that AEW reached out to Jay White In 2018, however, White told the promotion that he was under New Japan Pro Wrestling contract until 2025. So Meltzer says this, and I quote, okay, the Jay White stuff, I have not spoken to Jay White, and New Japan isn't saying anything which makes me think it's an angle, and it probably is. When AEW was forming, so this would be late 2018, Obviously, they wanted Jay White. All of those guys worked with him. They know how good he is. I mean, they knew without the push from New Japan how good Jay White's potential was and how good he is. He's even better now. He told AEW when they talked to them in 2018, he said that he signed a seven-year contract in 2018. He said, I just signed a seven-year contract now Meltzer goes on to say, I don't know if that's true, but I know that's what he said. So you could take it from there as far as all of this stuff, end quote. Now, additionally, Jay White was taken off the New Japan Pro Wrestling's website from their roster page. Now, I'm not looking into this at all. I'm not looking into this as, oh, he's going to WWE, oh, he's going to show up in the Royal Rumble, oh, he's going to NXT. I'm not looking into... This whatsoever. Jay White is not going anywhere. As far as I'm concerned, it's all an angle. It's all an angle. He's staying with New Japan. This is the guy that they built the company around and they put him at the top when Omega and the Bucks and Page all left to go do AEW. He was the guy. After Omega left, he was the guy that was in that spot. Why would they just willingly let him go without offering him a new deal if his contract was up? Why would they go and do that? Why would they go and push him knowing that, hey, 
I'll be here for the time being, but I want to go to the States and I want to go to World Wrestling Entertainment. Why would they do that? They got this guy under contract. They want to get people talking. Jay White isn't going anywhere. They just got a U.S. TV deal somewhere with some network. We don't know anything about that yet. Jay White's going to be a big part of that. They want Jay White to be a big part of that. Why would they not have him be a big part of that? Now, if there's a working relationship with AEW, then we may end up seeing Jay White on w, uh, on AEW television, not WWE. If he was to go to WWE, I don't see him showing up in the Royal Rumble. I don't know why anybody would want him to go to the main roster or show up in the Royal Rumble. If Jay White does go to the WWE, he's going right to NXT. Now, I'm not saying he doesn't have the potential to break out in WWE. I know very well that he has the potential to do that, but he's not AJ Styles. He's nowhere near AJ Styles level. For all those people saying, well, AJ Styles did it. AJ Styles is AJ Styles. There's only one AJ Styles. AJ Styles is this current generation's Shawn Michaels. Jay White is Jay White. So I don't want to see people saying, hey, Jay White should go to the Royal Rumble and have a big night like AJ Styles did. He should go to the main roster. That tells me you are not a Jay White fan because you are pretty in on how WWE works. Jay White being booked by Bruce and by Vince? Give me a break. Give me a fucking break. Now, it's also possible that Jay White may have been lying to those who reached out to him from AEW. Does put the report that his deal with New Japan is up this month in question. So we don't know. We don't know. This is the Omega thing all over again. When Omega was a free agent, what happened? Oh, I want AJ Styles at WrestleMania. Oh, WWE is offering me this amount of money to come to the main roster and yada, yada, yada. What did he do? He stayed with New Japan. Because he wants to do things that he did not accomplish in the mega run that he had there the first time. He wanted to stay and win the world title, and that's exactly what he did. Jay White, he's staying with New Japan. It makes no sense for him to go to WWE right now. Speaking of overseas, WWE is rumored to be adding another television show, this time for India, called the Superstar Spectacle. Now, top WWE superstars are rumored for this event, and this new show is airing on January 26th, which is actually Republic Day in India. This new show will be the start of a brand new show for the company. New brand, new show, we don't know exactly what's going on. To happen here, if it's going to be an extension of NXT India, or if it's just going to be another show that's going to be airing over there, we don't know where it's going to be filmed. We don't know anything about this new show. The current rumor is that Raw and SmackDown superstars are going to be involved in this new superstar spectacle. Now, it was previously reported that Jinder Mahal, the name gives me fucking chills just saying it in the worst way possible. Imagine him winning the Royal Rumble and we get Jinder Mahal versus Drew McIntyre for the WWE title at WrestleMania. There are some people out there that want that to happen, folks. I kid you not. I swear to God. There's something mentally wrong with those people. And the Bollywood boys, they were featured in a commercial to hype up Superstar Spectacle. Now, big names like AJ Styles, Drew McIntyre, Charlotte Flair. Charlotte Flair! Charlotte Flair, you know, the android, the one who speaks and walks like an android, Charlotte, you know. New Day, Bailey, they're all reportedly on the table to appear on the upcoming superstar spectacle. It appears that WWE is going to present the biggest names and the biggest showcase possible while highlighting their Indian talent at the same time. Talents such as Jinder Mahal, Kavita Devai. If you guys remember her, she was in the Mae Young Classic. Is it Devi or Devai? Who, who knows? It's the way I say it. It's my show. You want to take me to English class? So be it. Go start your own fucking show. Bollywood boys, Indus Share. You know, those clowns that uh, ousted Keith Lee winning the North American and NXT title at a taped NXT show. 
that went head to head with AEW, those guys. They're also going to be on the show, along with many superstars of tomorrow that fans have yet to see on a larger stage, meaning several Indian talents that they have contracted, but they're awaiting to put them on TV in the proper moment. WWE conducted tryouts last year, and they have their eyes on many talents. This is a continuing story, and more information will be made when it is available. Folks, Superstar Spectacle, it is what it is, man. Are are you going to watch Superstar Spectacle? I'll tell you what, man. I will say this and we're going to move on because I, quite frankly, don't give a fuck about any added brands, any any added shows. There's enough terrible programming to go around, man. I don't need another fucking three hours of anything. Another hour, another two hours, I don't need it. But any show that's going to be spearheaded by Jinder Mahal, give me the fucking remote control, man. Where's my boy, Guy Fieri? Please. More details on WWE not having fans or why WWE will not have any fans at the Royal Rumble. Now, since since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, fans have not been allowed. Obviously, you guys know AEW is probably the only show right now. NXT, I guess they have fans. I wouldn't necessarily call them fans. They don't really make enough noise to be, you know, constituted as fans. And we hear banging on the glass or the steel fences there around ringside. It is what it is. It's not to where it needs to be. Now, AWS fans, they have fans in the 700 to 1,000 range. They had, I believe it was reported 1,100 for Brody Lee's tribute show on Dynamite a couple of weeks back. Now, there are a number of fans, like I said, in NXT that show up to the TV tapings live there at the Capitol Wrestling Center. AWS fans... No fans for Raw, no fans for SmackDown. Now, WWE really wanted to have fans for SummerSlam. That was a a pipe dream for Vince McMahon. We all thought that, hey, it'll it'll be gone by the end of the summer. Seems to be getting worse. SummerSlam, no fans. Everything else after that, no fans. Now, that got pushed back to the Royal Rumble, and now the Royal Rumble will have no fans. This is reported by John Alba. That WWE's desire to make this happen is no more, and the wait continues to have fans back in attendance for main roster shows. WrestleVotes noted this week that one of the main reasons for not having this show with fans, the Royal Rumble, with no fans, is due to the logistical nightmare of tearing down the Thunderdome setup for one night and then having to try to rebuild it again in less than 24 hours for Monday Night Raw the next night. Now, the other big reason for fans not being in attendance is due to the great increase in positive COVID-19 cases. Whatever. John Alba also added this, and I quote, WWE holds the Royal Rumble pay-per-view on January 31st at Tropicana Field in St. Petersburg, Florida. That's what he has to say about that because I think it's pretty well known that WWE is not going to have any fans. So WWE is not wanting to break down the Thunderdome because it's a logistical nightmare. How logistical of a nightmare is it? Who who said that you got to break down the Thunderdome? I'm not asking you to break down the fucking Thunderdome. Isn't there space around ringside? For you to put fans right behind the barricade? I think you can socially distance fucking people in and around the barricades around ringside where you see the hard cam right behind the commentary desk on the other side opposite the hard cam. Any type of life would be adequate for the Royal Rumble. And WWE's not opting to go with any fans at all. Now, you could socially distance these people. Fucking 50 to 100 people are going to make a lot of noise compared to zero people. The other big reason for fans not being in attendance is because of the great increase in positive COVID-19 cases. The more people are getting tested, which right now is in fucking record numbers, the more positive testing there will be. Give me a break. Not everybody has COVID-19. Give me a break. Now, I'm not going to bitch and moan about this, but I was looking forward to WWE saying, all right, new year, let's do this right. 
There's some playoff games in the football season that actually have fans in attendance for these playoff games. Rapid testing being done, you can go to the venue. Limited number, but there's going to be fans there. A thousand, two thousand fans is going to make more noise than zero fucking fans or have a piped in fucking Madden 21 soundtrack playing on the goddamn PA system. WWE could do it. They just don't want to. I was hoping WWE, like I said, would go into this new year with a new look. Let's try and get things back to normal. And they're not doing that. The Royal Rumble needs fans. It's bad enough that we got to listen to this piped in crowd noise that is altered by Vince McMahon, Kevin Dunn, and Bruce Prichard. They dictate who they want pushed. If they want to bury somebody, what do you think they do? No crowd reaction. They're physically telling you who they want and who they don't want. Now i got to listen to WWE give me a countdown from 10 with the buzzer going off in the Royal Rumble. And I know nobody is there. Everybody knows nobody's there with some geek on the fucking virtual screens. Awesome. Awesome. Now, there will be fans at WrestleMania. How many? I don't know. WWE is gauging what the NFL does. WWE is gauging what the Super Bowl does in February as far as fan attendance. Being that the Super Bowl is taking place in Raymond James Stadium. And WrestleMania right now, from what we all know, is taking place in Raymond James Stadium. If WWE sees that the Super Bowl is doing 20,000 fans, they're probably going to want to do 25,000 because that's what WWE does. 30,000 maybe. One-third capacity. We don't know. But WWE should have had fans at the Royal Rumble. That's just my my stance on it. But we're right back in the same boat that we were in when we left 2020. Piped in crowds and a fake buzzer going off with people counting down from 10 while 30 men and women come out for the Royal Rumble. Great. Great. Instead of excitement, it's going to be like, oh, man. It's like, I'm watching, it's like I'm watching an extended episode of Raw on Sunday night. Speaking of the Rumble. Speaking of the Rumble. This was reported by Ringside News. Now, I'm not taking this to heart yet. I don't know what they have planned. I hope to God not in what I'm about to read to you. But WWE is discussing the concept of this year's Royal Rumble match. Now, this is an exclusive from Ringside News. They asked around about, first of all, NXT. Is NXT going to be included in the 2021 Royal Rumble event? They were told exclusively that this is not the plan at this moment, but everything is being discussed. No NXT superstars have been told about their placement in the Royal Rumble right now, being that we're just two weeks away. They weren't told about any Rumble entries until very close to the event in previous years anyway, which was going to be my next point. Nobody knew that NXT was going to be in the Royal Rumble. All you heard from reports leading up to the Rumble is that there's going to be no NXT presence. There was a report last year leading into the Rumble, about three, four weeks before the Rumble, that it's going to be NXT involved. Because Survivor Series was NXT involved. So everybody was like, well, if Survivor Series was NXT involved, then Royal Rumble should be NXT involved. And everybody was pushing the AEW effect. Oh, WWE is absolutely going to push the Royal Rumble because they want... NXT to have a leg up on AEW on Wednesday nights. They want to get that roster in front of a bigger audience on on WWE main roster side to combat AEW. Then we found out it was not going to be NXT involved. The report said 10 from Raw, 10 from SmackDown, 10 from NXT would fill the Royal Rumble. And WWE did not do that. They did Raw and SmackDown and included Keith Lee and Matt Riddle. That's it. I might be missing one, but I don't think I am. They might have added just two NXT superstars in the Royal Rumble last year. 
And Matt Riddle lasted 90 seconds. He got eliminated by Baron Corbin. Keith Lee didn't last long either. But he had a nice little back and forth for just a little bit with Brock Lesnar. So that rumor was put to bed when we watched the Royal Rumble last year. It's probably going to be the same thing this year. We'll probably get one or two. Somebody that's really ready on NXT side. Maybe like an Adam Cole. Maybe we'll see somebody, one of the newer people on NXT's roster in the Royal Rumble. Who knows? Pete Dunne, maybe. Someone like that. Maybe a Dexter Loomis. Maybe a Bronson Reed. I could see big boy Bronson Reed in the Royal Rumble. I'm a big fan of Bronson Reed. So we'll see what happens there. So no NXT entries right now, but that clearly could change. Ringside News was further told that everything is being discussed and quote-unquote, even things that shouldn't be discussed, like the concept of the Royal Rumble match itself. I don't know what the fuck that means. This year could be a very interesting experience for the Royal Rumble inside Tropicana Field. Now, WWE, like I just said, won't have any fans for the Royal Rumble. There were never any plans to change their closed set policy. Removing the Thunderdome setup for one night would also be a huge undertaking, so they say. We're not asking to remove the Thunderdome setup. We're just adding you to include fans. Simple. The company can also do whatever they want in regards to how they shoot things and how they make things sound. What this means isn't entirely clear, but it could have something to do with the number of participants, the timing in which those participants come out, the rules, how the match is produced and filmed. We don't know what this means. They may be looking at other features to get the match in a way where it generates more excitement and amps fans up. For the big Rumble match. Men and women's matches. Now, I I don't know what this means. And and, and this concerns me for a multitude of reasons. I remember watching, I believe it was the 1995 Royal Rumble. And I was a pretty big WWE guy then. I'm a bigger WWE guy now because this is my job. I got the podcast, I got the channel, I got a predominantly large following in the community to all the haters out there who, you know, look the other way and hate that, I do. And it's not me stroking my own ego. I was a big fan of the Rumble, always been a big fan of the Rumble. I I love the Rumble every year. It's my favorite time of year. It's my favorite match. It's my favorite pay-per-view. Now, if they brought back King of the Ring, that's a different story, but the Royal Rumble is my go-to. It was the Royal Rumble with Shawn Michaels and the British Bulldog, Davey Boy Smith. They entered number one and two, I believe it was 1995. Pamela Anderson, former Baywatch babe, was there to watch the entire match unfold. Michaels and Davey Boy Smith came out at number one and two, and they were actually in the end as the last two guys in the ring. That's when Bulldog clotheslined Michaels over the top. One of his feet hit the ground. He was hanging on. He skinned the cat. He threw Bulldog over the top rope. He does the pose. And Pamela Anderson is there. He looks like a million bucks. That Royal Rumble was the first year in which WWE altered the rules and changed the concept of the Royal Rumble. For every year that we were young and watched the Rumble, it was every two minutes... Every two minutes, the buzzer would go off and WWE would have somebody come down the aisle. In that year, WWE went from two minutes to one minute. They went from 120 seconds to 60 seconds. For whatever reason, I don't know. They wanted to make the rumble more exciting. They wanted to make it more action-packed. They wanted to make it more fast-paced, rapid style, right? I don't know why they did that. I don't know how long that lasted, I believe it was the very next year they went and changed the rules again as far as the time allotted between superstars coming out. I hated that change. Now, I didn't mind the two minutes. Fans today are impatient. 
Some of you might not like the two minutes. I, for one, like the two minutes. For WWE now, two minutes might seem like a lot to you because there's now two Rumble matches, one for the men and one for the women. But the Royal Rumble at two minutes was a sweet spot when we were younger watching this show. Then they altered it to 60 seconds. Then they stopped at 90 seconds, and it's been 90 seconds for the majority since they made that change initially. Now, 90 seconds is a sweet spot. It's not too long. It's not too short. It's right in the middle. You got 90 seconds until someone comes out. What is WWE going to do? What are they going to do this year? What do you mean by changing the concept of the Royal Rumble? Are you going to go back to 60 seconds? I don't see how that makes the match better. In fact, in my eyes, I think that makes the match worse. It just shows you that WWE wants to rush through the Rumble match for whatever reason. I got a myriad of reasons why WWE would want to rush through the match. Maybe they don't have enough superstars believable to win the match. Maybe they're just creatively lazy to book a fucking Rumble match for the men and a Rumble match with the women. Maybe they don't want to spend five hours inside the Thunderdome with no live audience. And they want to rush through these shows because that's been one of their main things, ending these shows after two and a half, three hours. WrestleMania was three and a half hours on one night and then three and a half hours the next night. It was better for us. It was a better viewing experience. But is WWE, when they usually do the Rumble, is WWE going to take the Rumble from what we know it being six hours to three and a half hours? Are they going to change the time in between buzzers? I hope to God not. It lessens the impact of the Rumble. It takes away significantly the importance of the Royal Rumble. This is the one match that determines the main event of your biggest show of the year and you want to rush through it? It should be of epic proportions. You should be developing stories inside that Rumble. Who's the underdog? Who's going to be the Iron Man? Who's the odds are favorite but has his hopes dashed? There's nothing that you can tell as far as stories in 30 fucking seconds, 60 seconds coming out. I don't want that. Maybe they start with half of the field in the match and then they give you a lot of time and then the other 15 guys come out. I don't know what the fuck they're planning. Who knows what these fucking psychopaths It should be a match that is given enough time to tell the importance of what the winner gets. And what the winner gets is a main event championship match of his choosing at WrestleMania. Why would you go and do that and change that? This Rumble match has been a state. Would Pat Patterson want that? No. Why change something that he originally created? Keep it the way it is. You don't see matches like this that have a lineage of history altered and changed because they got to fit a current agenda for 2021. There's no fans in attendance. We got to change the Royal Rumble. I want fans more than anybody there, but that doesn't mean I want you to change the Royal Rumble because there's no fans. I'm still going to enjoy the Rumble. Just book it right. Just book it right. Now, what are the rules going to be? They can't possibly change the rules. It's a fucking battle royal. Over the top rope, you go. Both feet got to hit the floor. There's nothing that they can do unless WWE wants to keep the 90 seconds and maybe cut the number of participants from 30 to 20. Maybe we get 30 to 25. I don't know. Maybe WWE WWE does 20 people and they include pinfalls in this Royal Rumble. Like an Aztec Warfare Lucha Underground match. That's not the Royal Rumble. You're blatantly changing the entire match for absolutely no reason. Maybe they do change the participants from 30 to 20. I have no idea. I don't know. How the match is produced? Is it going to be semi-cinematic? Is it going to be taped? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. And this is the part that fucking just strikes fear into my soul. 
Maybe it's a way where they make Drew McIntyre look strong, yet have Bill Goldberg come out and win the entire fucking thing. Maybe it's something to do with that. I hope to God not. I don't know how you could possibly manage to change the concept of the Royal Rumble to do that and fit that narrative. No idea. No idea. I don't even know what brand he's associated with. Apparently, he's a part of Monday Night Raw. Or maybe he just shows up wherever the fuck he wants. If he's in a Monday Night Raw match challenging for the WWE title, maybe WWE's going to alter the rules. Maybe he could go into the Royal Rumble as a Raw superstar and challenge the SmackDown champion, which would be Roman Reigns, which nobody wants. I don't know. I don't know what WWE is planning on doing as far as changing the concept. The only thing I could possibly think of and the most normalized thing that I could possibly think of is taking the 90 seconds and doing 60 seconds. It's not that big of a deal, but in WWE's eyes, at 90 seconds, you're looking at a full hour, at least to finish that rumble. A full hour to finish that rumble. You got to keep in mind that you got a men's rumble and a women's rumble. That's going to be two hours plus. That's four and a half hours. It's four and a half hours allotted to two Rumble matches. Then they want a WWE title, which we all know is going to go fucking 90 seconds. I can see it right now. He misses the spear. He gets fucking Claymore. That's one ending. Or Claymore into a spear and Goldberg wins the fucking title. Something along those lines is going to happen. 90 seconds. Then you got Roman Reigns and Kevin Owens more than likely because I refuse to think Adam Pearce is winning that fucking Chance to win that, uh, that, that opportunity to win that match or get a title match. Then you got a possible United States title with Bobby Lashley and Matt Riddle. You got a women's match with Asuka, I'm assuming. Carmella, Sasha. Who the fuck knows? I don't, I don't, know, what the, I don't know what they got planned. Her business versus uh, who? The New Day? Are there even tag teams on Monday Night Raw? I don't know what the fuck they got for the undercard. The only thing that we know is Adam Pearce and Roman Reigns. As the as, as of the time right now I'm recording this. And Drew McIntyre versus Goldberg. That's it. Nothing else is officially announced. But if WWE does 90 seconds, right? That at least gives them an hour. If WWE goes to the 60 seconds, that shaves off 15 minutes of the actual rumble from where it is now. I could see them doing that. That's more of a normalized situation for the Royal Rumble. But changing the concept to merely fit the fact that you don't have fans in attendance, I mean, that's just ridiculous. You got one of these motherfuckers a year. Why are you trying to book shortcuts? Too bad. Too bad. This is 2021. It's a new year. Hopefully you went into this thinking new wanting to start fresh, here we are doing the same fucking thing that we ended 2020 on. Disappointment. Don't disappoint us with the Royal Rumble and changing the concept of the Royal Rumble. I mean, I always look at music to compare when I think of, if it's not broken, don't fix it. I always go to the Slayer Metallica conversation. Metallica was the biggest rock band on the planet, the biggest metal act on the planet with their first four albums, Kill Em All, Ride the Lightning, Master of Puppets, and and Justice for All. Then they went to the Black Album, which took a little bit of getting used to, but in the end, it was a great fucking record. You just had to get used to it. Then after that, they just completely fell off planet Earth, load, reload, Saint Anger, Give me a fucking break. s and was all right. Then you got uh, whatever the fuck they put out now. Give me a break. Metallica is not one of the greatest metal acts on planet Earth anymore. They changed their style to fit a current narrative for whatever reason. Maybe they just couldn't hack it anymore as thrash metal icons. Meanwhile, you got Slayer, who's been producing the same fucking music for 30 years. Yeah, it gets boring. Yeah, you want to branch off and do something new. But they always remained at what brought them to the dance. At their core, they remained Slayer. 
they were always Slayer. When you put on the headset, you can listen to fucking Slayer on day one and Slayer when they called it quits. It's the same fucking band. A little slower, a little older, not as good, but it's the same band. Why change what is not broken? I hope WWE doesn't go and change the Royal Rumble. I really hope to God not. Now, we can talk about the Royal Rumble, but WWE is planning not only changes for the Royal Rumble, which we don't know what they are right now, WWE is planning changes for WrestleMania 37. This is something that I kind of knew was happening. And the reason it's happening should be a surprise to nobody. The answer is very simple. It's been reported that WWE plans on moving WrestleMania from the West Coast at SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles, Englewood, California, to Raymond James Stadium in Tampa. Back in November, WrestleVolt sent out a report noting that WWE had talked about moving the date of the show to April 11th or April 18th. Now on Friday, yesterday, WrestleVotes noted regarding this possibility, and I quote from their Twitter, looks to be happening, which is good, end quote. Fightful, Sean Ross Sapp and his select, Fightful Select, reports that the internal plan for this show is to take place on April 11, 2021, two weeks after the original date. Should be noted that WWE, if they move it with this new date, then WrestleMania couldn't be held at either Tropicana Field or Amway Center because the Tampa Bay Rays and the Orlando Magic will be using those individual venues because MLB is going to be obviously at the start of their regular season and the Orlando Magic will be playing basketball at the Amway Center. It was added that Raymond James Stadium does not have events scheduled for that weekend, April 11th. Now, originally, WrestleMania 37 was supposed to take place on March 28th, 2021. You know, it's not really all that important. It might be just personal preference to you, to me, to everybody. But I actually prefer WrestleMania to be in April. I prefer it to be in April. I don't know when, first, second week of April, whatever the case may be. I would actually love, now I hope to God WWE doesn't go and do this because we don't need any more added shows. I really wish that they would put a precedent on making Monday Night Raw and SmackDown important shows. You don't need to, now that you're moving WrestleMania, quote unquote, potentially with the possibility of moving WrestleMania to April 11th, you don't need to add some makeshift fucking out of the blue, nonsensical fucking WWE pay-per-view for March now that your pay-per-view for March is being moved. WrestleMania from the 28th of March to April 11th. We don't need a WrestleMania in March now. It's moved to April. Oh, we don't need a pay-per-view rather in March. We're moving WrestleMania to April. All WWE has to do is out of the elimination chamber which one of the other championships that's not determined in the Royal Rumble will be decided, out of the Elimination Chamber, you take the rest of February and all of March to build towards WrestleMania. And you put a highlight, you put a spotlight, you put a precedent on Monday Night Raw and SmackDown to make them feel like big pay-per-view nights on a night that you want to make that show big. You don't need... A fucking pay-per-view to fill in for March now that you move in WrestleMania to April. I hope, keeping my fingers crossed, that doesn't happen. Now, why are they moving WrestleMania? It all has to do with getting fans in attendance. Maybe they feel like in April, A, the weather will be nicer. B, that might allow them to have more fans in attendance than previously thought of who knows maybe more people will be vaccinated by that point maybe the restrictions will be lessened maybe wwe will have more access to have more people in attendance at a later date so they're moving it back it's going to be in april they're not pushing it into may or into the summer like it was discussed last year vince doesn't want that he wants everything to line up the way He has always had it lined up for pay-per-views. But this absolutely has to do with people being vaccinated, the weather being nicer. Those are the two minor things. 
but more fans in attendance. Vince is not, and I repeat, he is not going into WrestleMania again with no fans. WrestleMania 37, whether you agree with it, whether you like it or not, will have 20 to 30,000 people in attendance. If not, if possible, more. If not more. If WWE is allowed to, they will have more. But they are watching the Super Bowl and they are looking at what the NFL is doing and they're going to have fans at Raymond James Stadium. It's going to be very interesting, but I urge WWE now... Listen, an official announcement's not made yet, so right now this is just speculation. But if they do end up moving WrestleMania, I pray to the fucking gods that they don't give us a makeshift pay-per-view in March to fill in the gap now left by WrestleMania. Just highlight Monday Night Raw because God knows those shows need some sort of importance. All right, we're talking about Omega and Okada, 40,000 in the Tokyo Dome. What are you saying, bro? Are you kidding me? You're telling me that that is the greatest wrestling match of all time, better than The Undertaker and Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 25, the greatest WrestleMania match of all time, probably the greatest match ever. Dude, seven stars? Come on, bro. It gave you every element of storytelling, bro. Athleticism. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Seven stars. You're you're rating this off of Meltzer's star rating? All the false finishes at, what, 57 minutes in? Kicking out of finishes left and right? Um, you might wanna, what's... Yeah, speaking of the greatest of all time. Um, yeah, it, it caught me off, yeah. I know. Let's do it? Yeah, let's do it. I think it's pretty safe to say that what I talk about here when it pertains to Charlotte Flair is the absolute truth. I don't sugarcoat anything. I don't hide my feelings for those that I like or those that I don't like. But I think it's pretty safe to say the majority of everybody knows that Charlotte Flair and this propaganda, this agenda, this narrative about her being the greatest of all time is complete bullshit. Now, you guys can sit there and take what I say as gospel or you could be a fucking geek out there who hates me but listens anyway and doesn't believe the things that I say. I know things that the average people do not. I know people that tell me things that I trust wholeheartedly. Absolutely, 100%. Who these people are, where these people work, what positions these people hold in the wrestling business. It's none of your business. I know. I know. Charlotte Flair is not happy with a specific column that looked at the heat she receives from online fans. Now, Charlotte Flair took to Twitter late Wednesday night to go on a rant. I know a thing or two about ranting. Wednesday night to go on a rant about a column written that looks at how she's booked and the heat she receives from fans. The article was titled, Does Charlotte Flair Deserve the Hate She Gets? To answer that title, me personally, the answer is yes. She deserves the hate she gets. With a caption of, Charlotte Flair catches a lot of heat for how WWE books her. Now, Flair went on hiatus for several months last year. She was out the majority of the year. After she buried Rhea Ripley, after she pretty much made the NXT women's division fucking awful, she went away. Several months gone. Then she made her surprise return at TLC in December by teaming with Asuka 
And after seven months away, what does WWE do? Oh, my Charlotte Flair. Oh, you've been away so many months, man. We got to give you a title because we can't have our queen without gold around her waist, man. We wouldn't be playing up to the queen aspect, man. The little baby Charlotte Flair. Aww. Imagine Charlotte Flair coming back and not having a title. That would be a creative fucking explosion. WWE booking Charlotte Flair without a title? Oh my God, what fucking planet am I living on? Came back at TLC, teamed with Asuka in a tag team that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It actually, now I am not a Lana fan by any means, but this just further proves this article's point Lana was on TV. Whether you want to admit it or not, it was fucking comical. And the reason why she was put through nine tables in nine straight weeks was was because of her husband. It was because of Miro going to AEW and saying some very bad things and sinning on Dynamite talking about the boss, Vince McMahon. But whether you like it or not, Lana was actually in a position to team with Asuka and win the tag team titles. That's where it was headed. Whether you like to admit that or not, That's where it was headed. What does WWE do? Lana, after all these weeks of telling this story and then pairing her with Asuka, Asuka's got a problem with Shayna Baszler, Asuka's got a problem with Nia Jax. Lana seeking aid in Asuka. What does WWE do? They take Lana off of TV and replace her with Charlotte Flair, leaving Lana to do what, actually? On WWE TV. Nothing. Nothing. Lick her wounds and wonder why she's not going to get booked on Raw again in a meaningful way. Buried. Charlotte came back and buried Lana. Because Lana is nothing in the eyes of WWE management. And Charlotte Flair is the fucking holy being that can do no wrong. Charlotte Flair has been booked as not only one of the top stars in the women's division, but in all of WWE for the past... Several years. Miss Flair says the following on Twitter as she's blasting this article, and I quote, I should just scroll block this garbage, but words matter, so I will take a few moments to educate you since both a human and I would assume an editor allowed this bullshit to sully Al Gore's internet I've taken time off three times while on the main roster. First time was when my dad was sick, which we are all grateful that your father is in good health. That is without any explanation. You don't need to explain that to me whatsoever. Your dad's sick. Go away. Be with him. Be with family. Fine. Nobody's zinging you on that. Second time was a six-week injury that was followed up by 18 months of staring at lights to help create a star. Who exactly is she creating? What star is she creating? It was a six-week leaky breast injury, surgery that she was out for to fix her plastic surgery. And this was followed by 18 months of staring at lights to help create a star. Which star did you help create? Was it Rhea Ripley? Was it Sasha Banks? Was it Becky Lynch? Was it Oscar? Was it Lana? Was it Ruby Riot? Was it Liv Morgan? Was it Nia Jax? Was it Shayna Baszler? Was it Shotzi Blackheart? Was it Tony Storm? Was it Ember Moon? Was it Peyton Royce? Was it Billy Kay? Was it Natalia? Was it Tamina? Was it Bailey? Am I forgetting anybody? Candice LeRae? Indy Hartwell? Who am I forgetting? Io Shirai? Bianca Belair? Carmella, which one of those did Charlotte Flair help create? The answer is very simple, folks. Zero. She helped create zero stars. Zero. The only star that Charlotte helped create was Charlotte Flair. Third time is now. 
What exactly is it that I'm avoiding? Well, I don't know. What are you avoiding, Charlotte? Putting over stars in your division to make the division better? Give the overall vibe that the health of the division is where it needs to be? I don't know. What are you avoiding? Putting somebody over? Selling? What exactly are you doing in the division? That's aiding anybody else. The only star that you're creating is yourself. The only thing that you're avoiding is putting others over. She continues. I keep looking for the article where you trash one of the male champions for taking time off and being inserted back into the title picture. I didn't find one. Shocking. I wonder why, she says. And she goes on to say, this little gem, I'm in the title picture and I will always be in the title picture. It's one of those unfortunate side effects of excelling at something you wouldn't understand. Well, I mean, give me a break, man. I excel at everything I fucking do on this show and in the podcasting realm. That's why I'm the number one most watched live every single week. So clearly I excel. Can't be talking about me. I do my job better than 99% of the community. Give me a break. And that's me speaking fact. Number two. I'm waiting for the article where you trash one of the male champions for taking time off and being inserted back into the title picture. Listen, honey. I don't know where you are or what fucking service you're using as far as internet provider or what platform of social media that you're using. But if you open your fucking eyes and get Charlotte Flair out of your head instead of wanting to bury everybody, maybe you'll find somewhere in the deep, dark secrets of social media that there are people that complain about the very same thing that you are complaining this fucking schmuck about We complain about the very same thing, whether you're female or male. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. She makes it into some sexist fucking comment or some sexist ideology. But this is 2021 where you got fucking people with IQs of a fucking crayon box. Given a platform of free speech to say anything they want. And that's what you're going to go and say as far as words mattering. I don't see how the fuck that mattered in this entire situation. If it was you, if it was Dolph Ziggler, if it was fucking Mojo Raleigh, I'd say the same thing. Bullshit. Charlotte is as dumb as the people that book her fucking career on Monday Night Raw. Now, now that that's out of the way, the smart people will understand. The ones who complain about the fucking men and women. No. Bully Ray. Bully Ray. Busted open radio. Bully Ray discussed Charlotte Flair. As soon as this news broke, He walked into Sirius Studios in New York City and he was fucking chomping at the bit, waiting to shit on fucking fans. But that's what Bully Ray does. Mr. Know-it-all, he don't give a fuck about anybody or anything or what anybody has to say about him and his fucking views. He wants to rub elbows with WWE management. Maybe he wants one more run as Bully Ray in WWE. Let me tell you something, bro. If Paul Heyman, if Paul Heyman never gave you an opportunity to do what you did in ECW, Vince McMahon wouldn't look at you at all. He would have never given you a shot. Never. Give me a break. Bully Ray is lucky he accumulated the career that he has right now and the resume that he has right now. Don't bullshit me. Bully Ray discussed Charlotte Flair. He claimed Charlotte Flair is one of the greatest women's performers ever. And that he finds it ridiculous that certain fans online slam her. 
He says, and I quote, you're always going to have people on social media who think that they understand or know what's going on in the ring. They think they know what makes a great talent. What makes a great talent? Charlotte Flair is at the top of the food chain all the time or all time when it comes to women's wrestling. All time, all time. He says all time. All time. I don't understand. Uh, He's not even done. I'm just cutting in and out to give you my thoughts immediately on this fucking garbage that I got to regurgitate to you. All time. I don't know, was Mike Trout the greatest MLB player of all time in his fourth year playing for the Angels? Was Andrew Jones the greatest center fielder of all time? Could he be in the discussion with Ken Griffey Jutin? Possibly. But greatest of all time? No. No. Was Barry Bonds the greatest slugger of all time? No. Because he cheated. Was Chipper Jones the greatest all-time brave in his third year? I don't understand you. Is Greg Maddox the greatest pitcher of all time? You could say that. You'd be wrong, but he's not. Is Mark McGuire or Sammy Sosa the greatest sluggers of all time? You may think Hank Aaron is the greatest slugger of all time. You may think Mickey Mantle or Babe Ruth was the greatest slugger of all time. Was Wade Boggs the best pure hitter in the history of MLB baseball? I don't know. You could say Don Mattingly was. You could say John Olrood was. You could say Paul O'Neill was. You could say Cal Ripken was. You could say Tony Gwynn was. What are you trying to explain to me about all time? All time. All time, Bully Ray. That's your prerogative. That's your opinion. You have a platform to fucking zombify your fucking fan base. That's your prerogative. My prerogative is she's not. I'm not wrong in me saying that. You're not wrong in you saying what you say either. Actually, you are. You look more clueless than anybody when she says, well, when you say she's the greatest of all time. She's not. She's nowhere close. Sasha Banks is everything that Charlotte Flair is not. Bianca Belair could be the greatest of all time. Is WWE going to allow her to do that? Or is WWE going to give her the platform to do that? As far as I'm concerned, Bianca Belair is the best pure athlete in all of WWE. But WWE shills Charlotte Flair as being the greatest pure athlete in WWE in her division when we know she's not. You say she's greatest of all time. She's not even greatest in the tag team that she resides in right now. She's not the greatest in the fucking company. You serious? I take Io Shirai. As far as in-ring ability goes over Charlotte Flair, I take Sasha Banks, I take Asuka. What are you trying to get out here? She may be fifth or sixth in the company. That doesn't make her greatest of all time. To you and your zombified fucking mummified audience that might make them the or that might make her the greatest of all time. Give me a break. She's not. He goes on to say this. She's possibly in the top three females of all. Oh, but you just got done saying she was the greatest of all time on multiple occasions in the same quote. But now you're backtracking because you know that your statement is full of garbage. Possibly in the top three females of all time. So she went from being greatest of all time to in the top three. We don't know whether that's number one, number two, or number three. But he's got to push the Charlotte narrative. It's not even up for debate. That's a cold, hard fact. And to sit there on social media and talk crap about Charlotte, oh, She's only in that spot because of her father. I mean, how old is that one? It's never going to get old if you ask me, because that's exactly why she is where she is. Because of Rick. Because of Mr. Flair. Because, of course, if she didn't have the last name of Flair, 
She wouldn't be as athletic as she is. She wouldn't be as good as she is. She wouldn't have the gear that she has, which is, let's be honest, Mr. Ray is nothing more than a female knockoff of what Rick used to wear. Just stop it already. Bully Ray finished by calling out the detrimental fans online by saying, you look completely foolish and ignorant. But, but, no, but, but he doesn't look foolish and ignorant for saying that she was the greatest of all time and then quickly backtracking within the next 30 seconds to say that she is possibly in the top three females of all time, which is not the greatest of all time. Who looks foolish here? Who looks ignorant here? Ray then finally stated, if you take the social media and start bashing one of the greatest of all time, you look foolish and ignorant, end quote. I am so sick and tired. I seen Gorilla Position on Twitter say the same thing and they're in very much the similar boat, similar fashion to Bully Wright. Charlotte's the greatest of all time, end of discussion, no questions asked. As if Trish Stratus and Lita had no impact on WWE and what the women do. As if AJ Lee never had an impact on what the women do. As if the Bellas, not a Bella fan, as if the Bellas have no fucking impact over what the women are doing nowadays on WWE TV. If you ask me, Nikki, Brie, AJ, Trish, and Lita, Beth Phoenix, and those women have more of an influence, a greater influence over everything that women division has ever accomplished over Charlotte Flair. That is no questions asked. I don't want to hear another fucking peep from anybody. Without them, there'd be no fucking Charlotte Flair. Without them, women right now would still be booked in broad panty matches. Without them, they'd be in 30-second fucking, let me see how quick I could get this one in, type of matches. Now you're getting me fucking heated. She is nowhere close to being the greatest of all time, and when she finishes her career, she's not going to be the greatest of all time. I am sick and fucking tired of people telling me that Charlotte is the greatest of all time. She's not. I'm sick and tired of talking about this fucking... This fucking topic. I'm tired of it. But it's always there. Like a fucking hemorrhoid. It's always there. We look foolish and ignorant. How many matches? There'd be a couple, right? How many instances? How many title reigns? Oh, Charlotte Flair. Do you go back and do you look as being memorable? Do you have any memorable Charlotte Flair moments? Eh. They're good. It's, not, it's nothing along the lines of me going back and watching Stone Cold Steve Austin and Bret Hart at WrestleMania 13 or Mick Foley versus The Undertaker at King of the Ring, Shawn Michaels and Undertaker WrestleMania 25, Johnny Gargano versus Adam Cole, Johnny Gargano versus Tommaso Ciampa. None of those matches. None of those matches, nothing that Charlotte has done is even close to being memorable like those matches. Steamboat and Macho Man, Bret Hart, Piper, the list goes on and on. You can see there all day and talk about fucking matches that have meaning. What has Charlotte Flair done in her six-year career where she's the greatest of all time after six fucking years? What has she done that's important? What has she done that's memorable? Nothing. Absolutely zero. For as many title matches that she's had in, as many titles as she's won, she's lost just as much. And WWE has given her that statistic and that accolade because they're pushing a narrative. They want her to break her father's record because we're on this fucking agenda to make Charlotte Flair the greatest of all time. When we know she's not. This is somebody that was never planned to win the Royal Rumble last year. It was always Shayna Baszler. 
Always. That was the direction. Where did WWE go? They gave it to Charlotte. Why did they give it to Charlotte? Because she's never won a Royal Rumble before. And I would bet my fucking bottom dollar that she would not get eliminated or refuse to be eliminated by an NXT talent. So she won the Royal Rumble. After Shayna eliminated eight women in about 90 seconds. Nobody wants to talk about that one though, right? Then Shayna Baszler goes on to win the Elimination Chamber and eliminate five other women, being the only person, man or woman, to do that in Elimination Chamber history. Then Charlotte goes on to be challenged by Rhea Ripley. She wins the NXT title at WrestleMania, which was one of the worst booking decisions in the history of NXT. One of the worst booking decisions in decades on the main roster, but nobody's going to bat an eyelash at that one, right? No, it's just a decision, a creative decision that still Rhea Ripley is fucking suffering for. But nobody's going to talk about that. That woman hasn't felt the same since last December. Not 2020, 2019, when she won the fucking title. Charlotte, it was reported, was supposed to lose. NXT had plans. Charlotte had plans. Which one trumped over the other? Charlotte pushed her agenda to the main roster, and Charlotte was never going to lose to Rhea Ripley at WrestleMania. Why? Because Charlotte Flair refused to put Rhea Ripley over. So Charlotte Flair wins the title, and Charlotte Flair goes to NXT to do what exactly? I don't know. All I know is she killed the fucking division, buried half of the fucking talent that was down there, only to go into a triple threat match with Rhea Ripley and Io Shirai at TakeOver In Your House to do what? I don't know. Maybe put the fucking title back on Rhea Ripley? Maybe put over a new talent that hopefully makes it big on the main roster? Nah. She gets put into that title match as champion to do what? Not take a fucking pinfall. EO pinned Rhea. Now, but I'm supposed to overlook that though, right? And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There is so many more instances where this is just common theme for Charlotte Flair. What I just described to you is common up and down Charlotte Flair's career. She's a selfish bitch. I don't know her. I know she doesn't book her own matches. I know she doesn't take her creative and run with it. She doesn't have creative freedom over what she does. But you'd be an ignorant fucking fool if you don't think that she's got the ear of Bruce. But you don't think Bruce Prichard loves and adores Charlotte Flair. His podcast partner is married to her fucking sister. Of course she's going to get preferential treatment. Conrad is a flair. And you think Bruce is bad? Vince McMahon sees her as the fucking creme de la creme. She's never going to have a fucking off day in her entire career. Why? Rick, Bruce, and she's blonde. And she's adored by management. Because she's got that lineage. Everybody else doesn't have that fucking lineage. You think Sasha Banks is going to have that type of career in WWE, even though we all know she's the bigger star? When I walk into a room and Sasha and Flair are standing there, I'm going to think 10 times out of 10 that Sasha's the biggest star because of how she comes off. I would look at Charlotte as, this is a cocky bitch who don't deserve half of what she's accumulated. Folks, when Charlotte Flair, I'm going to end with this because I'm, I'm sick and tired of talking about this shit. I got a whole nother fucking 40 minutes to go here. I want you to look at Charlotte Flair and what she's done. She's been back for two months now. Going on two months, a month, whatever. She's been back and the division has been worse off for it. She's made nobody better. Everybody that she's been in the ring with has not benefited from being in the ring with Charlotte Flair. She doesn't know how to sell properly. She's sloppy at times. She's good at times. She's great at times. But she's not flawless. She's not the Bret Hart of the women's division. 
So she's not the greatest of all time. I can never, ever pinpoint when Bret Hart was off on a night. That guy was the Greg Maddox of fucking MLB pitchers. Seriously. Or the Greg Maddox of WWE wrestlers, I would say. Maddox, an MLB pitcher for the Braves and the Cubs and the Padres. He was almost the Yankee, but fuck the Yankees. He was that scientific. The guy was always on. Perfect in every, every way. Charlotte Flair's not that. When she's off, she's bad. When she's great, she could be great. When she's good, she's all right. But how many people that have been in the ring with Charlotte Flair have been better off for it? Just look at Rhea Ripley, for example. This was a big first time ever match. Big match. Getting ready to put Rhea over is the next big thing. What happened? What happened? Was Rhea better off for it? I don't see how anything Rhea Ripley is doing right now is stemming from Charlotte Flair. And don't tell me it's a long-term storyline where Rhea Ripley's going to eventually get her revenge. Five years later? Give me a break. Charlotte Flair, if Charlotte Flair was so great, if Charlotte Flair was the greatest of all time, why isn't she emitting that Roman Reigns vibe? You know, Roman Reigns, Roman Reigns and I, the character, have not seen eye to eye for the last six years. All it did was WWE pairing him with Paul Heyman and making him a heel. For everybody to see the light, for Roman to see the light, for me to get what I've asked for for six years, what are you doing? Now that he's healed, what is the one thing I say all the time about Roman? Everything he says, everything he projects, everything he does, everybody that he's in the ring with turns to gold. There's a reason why he wears the gold glove, because he has the Midas touch. Everybody that's been in the ring with Roman Reigns and Jey Uso is the ultimate example. Roman Reigns being in the ring with Jey Uso has made us forget about Jimmy Uso. When we all seen before this happened, Jey Uso as nothing more than a tag team wrestler. Now we've forgotten about Jimmy Uso. Jimmy's there. Jimmy's in the back of our mind, but we're not thinking about the Usos. We're thinking about how Roman Reigns has gotten Jimmy Uso over in a singles role away from his brother. Kevin Owens has been a lost soul on SmackDown. Kevin Owens is now the second biggest thing on SmackDown. Why? Because he's in a feud with Roman Reigns. Shinsuke Nakamura is now feeling that effect. Immediately after one week, you put him in a gauntlet match and have him attacked by Roman Reigns and the bloodline whatever the fuck you want to call him, the Samoan dynasty, bloodline, whatever the group is called, they went after Shinsuke Nakamura. With Roman Reigns now involved, Shinsuke looks better in one week than he's looked in three years. And what do you think that's going to do to enhance Daniel Bryan's upcoming feud with Roman Reigns? And everybody else that follows after Bryan, whether it's a Rollins or a Big E or a fucking Dwayne, Does Charlotte Flair have that effect on everybody else? When you find where Charlotte Flair has done all of that, then you let me know. Roman Reigns, and when did he come back? In September? September, October, November, December. Roman Reigns in four months has done more than six years of Charlotte Flair being on the main roster. So when you tell me she's the greatest of all time, I want you to compare her to what Roman Reigns is doing now. And when you can find that Charlotte Flair is doing exactly what Roman Reigns is doing, then you can come and address me and argue my points. Until then, I kindly and respectfully tell you to fuck off and shut your fucking mouth. Charlotte Flair is overrated, overpushed, and doesn't deserve 75% of the shit that we've seen from her on television. She's the female Roman Reigns when Roman Reigns was a babyface. And nobody wants to be Roman Reigns as a babyface. I mean, since we're going to bounce off of that fact of talking about greatest matches, as I said, fact, because, you know, that's debatable with those two. We're gonna talk about it as concrete, but this thing here, if we're gonna talk about the greatest, 
You're going to talk Louis XIV? Yeah, and if we're going to talk about that in hindsight, I need to know a little bit more, and I know that you've been doing your research. Well, a bottle like this ranges about $3,000. It could go anywhere between one hundred and forty-five dollars to $25,000. From what I know, the most expensive bottle is $169,000. With that being said, you would say that this is probably the greatest taste in uh, liqueur. Would you say so? I would say so. This is the Shawn Michaels and Undertaker of liqueurs. Here we go again. Told you. We gotta go I'm again. I'm gonna let you live it down. We'll talk about it some more after the shots. Of course. Let's do it. Salud, my friend. Let's do it. Oh, shit. Absolutely amazing. Want some more? Of course I want more. You think they want some more? Of course they want more. You know they're gonna have to tune into the full episode. Of course they will. <laughs> then we're gonna go. And they will. You, you gotta get the full episode. You're not gonna get the whole thing here. Coming soon. CNC. Moving on. Mustafa Ali. He might have backstage heat. I just got done reporting last week that this was a work shoot. That Ali's taking the ball into his own hands and he's running with this retribution gimmick. Now that I have let this sit for a week, Mustafa Ali might actually have backstage heat. Why? Because he mentioned that WWE uses fake crowd noise inside the WWE Thunderdome. Now, this was a heated back and forth with Charlie Caruso on Raw Talk. Who watches Raw Talk? I have no idea. Mustafa Ali criticized Raw Legends Night, just like everybody else did, noting that WWE were pumping in more crowd noise for guys who could barely walk. Now, it was first thought that Ali may have annoyed somebody backstage when he tweeted a photo of himself on Raw Talk with the caption, and I quote, we don't know if we can give you a live mic again. Now, Sean Raw Sapp, over at Fightful Select, said somebody off screen was rubbed the wrong way by Ali's comments about the piped-in crowd noise. Who this person was was not named. Somebody off screen. Could be Kevin Dunn, could be PSAs, could be Bruce, could be Vince, could be anybody. I don't see what the big fucking problem is. Noting that WWE didn't want fake audience sounds mentioned in the promo at all. So Sean Ross Sapp said this, and I quote, I had heard that there was someone who took exception to him making light that they pipe in stuff. I was asked about this. I was like, what would anybody be mad at? And they're like, well, he said they piped in noise. So I said, they do. And this person said, yeah, but we don't want them going out there and saying that. And I follow up with, why not? It's obvious. It's okay. Baseball does it. Football does it. Basketball does it. Don't treat the fans as if we are stupid. End quote. Now, it's ironic that Ali is leading a fucking group of people that don't want to be silenced, yet he's now being silenced. Coincidence? I think not. But apparently his words have landed him in hot water. Ali has not had a televised match in 2021 yet. And he last wrestled Ricochet on the last Raw of the year. How petty is WWE, folks? My God, if you are watching this show thinking that live noise is emanating from those fucking virgins on the screens, you got a problem. And this is where this frustration comes in because I know there are people there that don't like what WWE is doing with the piped in crowd noise because they physically have control of everything. Whereas if you're in a live setting with 10,000 human beings there, they dictate who they like, who they don't like, what they like, what they don't like, how good the show is, how bad the show is. Ali is being punished. Whether this is true or not, I don't know. Am I shocked? 
Would I be surprised if he does have heat because of this? No. Absolutely not. They're always looking for a way to punish somebody or give somebody a reason to be in hot water. And WWE doesn't really give a shit about Ali. They don't. No matter how much TV time he has, no matter what leader he is of which group, doesn't matter. They don't give a fuck, okay? But there is frustration from WWE over piped in crowd noise inside the Thunderdome. Now, Meltzer says that some of the athletes don't like this. Some, I would say the majority of them don't like it because they draw a conclusion that WWE doesn't care if they get over, if their piped in reaction isn't as distinct as a top star's would be. Meltzer says this, and I quote, the ability to completely control reactions has led to frustration in some on the undercard because they realize that the company creates the sound based on who they want to push and who they don't want to push. And then you have to face the fact that you are not on the list of people that they want to push. And whatever you do, you can't get the reaction from the fans to change that because there are no fans. End quote. Now, this is absolutely true. And I'm going to use Matt Riddle and Keith Lee as an example. Matt Riddle was incredibly over on the main roster. Incredibly over on uh, NXT, rather, compared to the main roster. When Matt Riddle was in the ring, we always heard the chance of Riddle, Riddle, right? Because they knew he was feuding with Goldberg. Goldberg, they used the same, the, the same monotone tone to chant Riddle's name in the vein of Goldberg. How many times have you heard that on the main roster? I haven't heard Riddle chanted once via the piped-in crowd noise in the Thunderdome. So how over is Matt Riddle in the eyes of WWE? They don't want him to be over. They just want him to be a mid-card comedy geek. What about limited Keith Lee? And I use the term limited seriously because that's exactly what has happened to Keith Lee. How many times on NXT have we heard, oh, bask in his glory, right? To the back of his fucking shirt. How many times have we heard that? On the main roster. That was a staple in every match he wrestled at Full Sail University. I haven't heard that chant once. Why? Because they don't want Keith Lee to be over. Miro is the other example. He's not even with the fucking company anymore. He's not even with the company anymore. But Rusev detailed that Vince McMahon thought that the fans chanting Rusev Day meant that the fans were against Rusev. That they were making fun of of Rusev. I don't see how that's possible. So if Miro or Rusev was in WWE still as Rusev in the Thunderdome, do you think you'd hear any Rusev Day chants? No. Because if Vince McMahon thinks that it's detrimental to him, that the fans are making fun of him, that they're not siding with him, then they're not going to fucking push the button to play Rusev Day. They push who they want, they bury who they want. They control fan reactions. You don't know who's over. You don't know who should be over at all. But the one thing that's prominent is you know who's fucking buried. You know who's getting the fucking short end of the bullshit stick in WWE. Of course, there's frustration. You hear new day rocks on the PA. You hear the yes chants, right? You hear the shit with Miz and Morrison. Whatever the fuck they do for uh, the uh, dumb talk show that they do. You hear things like that. You hear chants that are appropriate to those wrestlers who they want to be over. You hear the woo when Charlotte Flair makes a chop. Right? All this shit. You don't hear this for any up and coming guys in WWE. Nothing. They don't do anything to aid the young up-and-coming talent. And then they want to blame the uh, young and up-and-coming talent for not being more over. How the fuck could you? You're in control of what I'm doing. WWE, man, bullshit. I hate this fucking company. I wish things would change, but the more I complain, the more 
things remain the same. SmackDown. WWE has ratings in for SmackDown. Not, not last night's show, the week before. SmackDown averaged 2.003 million viewers, which was up from the week prior, which did 1.915 million viewers. First hour did a 2.036. Second hour did a 1.969. And the show did in hour one, 1.996 the previous week. And then hour two did 1.834. Averaged 0.50 in the ratings, 18 to 49 demo, number two for the night. That is the same as the 0.50 rating in the 18 to 49 demo the show did the week prior. Show featured a gauntlet match in the second hour to determine the number one contender for Roman Reigns Universal title. Big E defeated Apollo Crews. Apollo Crews seems to be undergoing some sort of heel change, possibly. That's been rumored when he was on Raw when Paul Heyman was still in charge. That never came to fruition. Apollo Crews was then blasted by Paul Heyman in a fantastic promo on Talking Smack on Saturday morning. I urge you to go and watch that segment. But we're getting, I believe, a match. Now, I'm recording this before SmackDown on Friday night. We may be getting a rematch on SmackDown tonight, which you guys would have already watched, maybe. So I don't know yet. But it looks like Apollo Crews is not done with the IC title. The Dirty Dogs beat the Street Profits and won the SmackDown Tag Team titles. And the only reason why this happened was because if the Street Profits beat the Dirty Dogs, Dolph Ziggler and Bobby Roode clean, then there would be nobody else on the brand for them to wrestle. Nakamura apparently is going singles from what we were shown on Friday. So he's clearly not teaming with Cesaro anymore. Gable and Otis could be a tag team. Makes me wonder why they even broke Otis away from Tucker, but I'm not here to ask questions. Bruce is shitty at his job. And there legitimately is no other tag team on SmackDown right now. Maybe the Lucha House Party, but they're on NXT and the Dusty Classic. Maybe the Knights of the Lone Wolf, a.k.a. the Forgotten Sons, who have not been in a match, but Jackson Riker has had two matches on WWE television. The guy that everybody fucking hated. Don't understand. The only reason why they won those titles is because they're looking for a rematch now. Because the Profits have nobody but the Dirty Dogs in the division to challenge. And vice versa. Don't know why you don't merge the divisions, but I've repeated this more times than I've complained about Charlotte Flair. And it goes nowhere. Daniel Bryan versus Sami Zayn versus Baron Corbin versus Shinsuke Nakamura versus Rey Mysterio. This was a gauntlet match. That was won by Adam Pearce. The GM of Monday Night Raw and SmackDown on Fox. But J.D., he wasn't featured in the names that you just listed. I know. I know. Nakamura beat Rey Mysterio. Nakamura beat Corbin. Nakamura beat Daniel Bryan. Where the Shinsuke Nakamura push is coming from, I don't know. Maybe WWE's riding the coattails of Strong Style coming out of New Japan, Pro Wrestling, and Wrestle Kingdom. Maybe Nakamura has a fucking contract up, and they're looking at booking him strong now because he's threatening to leave. And he hasn't re-upped. I have no idea. But the Shinsuke Nakamura push is coming out of nowhere, and I don't like it. Does he deserve it? No. If the guy was a superstar, he should have been booked like that on Friday for the last three fucking years. But he hasn't. Now you want me to believe in Nakamura. Now you want me to push for Nakamura getting a title shot against Roman Reigns. Now you want me to feel bad for Nakamura. No. No, I won't. Why Brian wasn't pinned by Adam Pearce. I don't know. Adam Pearce won the gauntlet match by pinning Nakamura because Jey Uso and Roman Reigns attacked Nakamura before the bell to start the match, the final gauntlet match, the part of the gauntlet match with Adam Pearce. That was SmackDown. Dynamite wins in the ratings. AEW was up. NXT was down. Dynamite drew 762,000 live viewers. NXT did 551,000 live viewers. AEW was up against strong competition. NXT was down. AEW did last week 662, and NXT did 641. AEW was ranked number 31 on the cable top 150 shows, which was predominantly just slaughtered by news coverage. 
of Trump being impeached. There's always something. Always something. NXT was number 70, as is the case in most weeks. AEW won the 18 to 49 demographic. NXT didn't even chart in all the other demos, but AEW beat NXT in the 18 to 49 demo 0.3 to 0.14. So that's that. Darby Allen retained the TNT title against Brian Cage in a great television main event. Excellent match, which saw Sting help Darby make the save, helping him retain the title. Serena Deeb defeated Tay Conti to retain the NWA women's title. Miro defeated Chuck Taylor, and now Chuck Taylor needs to be Miro's butler for the month. Jurassic Express fell to FTR. Marco Stunt and Jungle Boy, not Luchasaurus. Pac defeated Eddie Kingston with the Black Arrow. Cody joined Britt Baker on the waiting room. And that was interrupted by Jade Cargill, which led to a big brawl. And then Thunder Rosa coming after Britt Baker at Beach Break on February 3rd. And Kenny Omega and the Good Brothers screwed the Young Bucks. They defeated Griff Garrison, Brian Pillman Jr., and Danny Limelight in a six-man tag right before Impact's Hard to Kill pay-per-view this Saturday, today. Right before this goes live, you guys are probably getting ready to go watch that if you are indeed watching that, minus Josh Matthews because he's not going to be on commentary. Matt Stryker is the new play-by-play guy for Impact, which sounds pretty damn good to me because Matt Stryker's fucking great. Johnny Gargano defeated Dexter Loomis via outside interference by Austin Theory. Don't like the way Dexter Loomis lost, but... I'm assuming he'll uh, silently cry wolf because he doesn't speak and get a rematch at the pay-per-view. Maybe at the pay-per-view. Don't know. Looks like they're setting up Kushida versus Johnny Gargano, which I would not be opposed to at all. That should be fantastic. He did interfere and help Loomis attack Theory and attack Gargano after the match was over. Candice LeRae defeated Shotzi Blackheart. Decent little match there. MSK. This is the former Rascals defeating Isaiah Scott and Jake Atlas. A lot of people were asking me about my thoughts on MSK. Listen, they're fine. MSK should do very well. This was a good match. I mean, Isaiah Scott's a part of it. I don't know how the fuck it could be a bad match. This was a good match. The fact that they're in the Dusty Classic, I like it. I like it. I like that. They are added to the tag team division in NXT because it sorely needed another tag team in this division. But if you're asking me what I really think of MSK, you want my true thoughts on MSK, and God bless them, I hope they kill it in NXT. But if you think there is a ceiling past NXT for these guys, you are a complete ignorant fool. Their ceiling is NXT. They either go to 205 Live and fail and become irrelevant, then bitch and moan about WWE not using them right. Or they go to the main roster and Vince McMahon has them fucking chasing R-Truth for the 24-7 title like he has the Lucha House Party. Give me a break. Vince and Bruce are never, and I repeat, never going to push a tag team nonetheless. Two guys like MSK. Give me a break. Good match. They defeated Isaiah Scott, Jake Atlas, and advanced in the Dusty Classic. Undisputed Era defeated Breezango in the main event of the show. This is Roderick Strong and Adam Cole. They advance in the Dusty Tag Team Classic. And at the end of the match, we had Pete Dunne attack Kyle O'Reilly. Go for the jaw. He's got a problem with Kyle O'Reilly. He's looking to target Finn Balor for the NXT Championship. I don't know if that's going to take place. On Valentine's Day, February 14th, with TakeOver. Don't know if it has a name or not, if it's going to be numbered or not. I have no idea. But it looks like they may be saving Cross for WrestleMania weekend. Or if they have a TakeOver WrestleMania weekend, I don't know. Maybe they do. Maybe they do. From what I see and the TakeOver schedule, it looks like we got one in December. We're going to get one in February. Maybe we get one in April. I think the last time we've seen the takeover was in May. Because they've kind of positioned themselves to have these shows away from the main roster. To stand as their own separate entities. I don't know. We didn't get a WrestleMania takeover last year. Maybe we get one this year. 
But you know that title's coming off Balor, and it's going right to Cross. This Pete Dunne thing, if it does happen, it may happen on NXT, and we may get Balor versus Cross at TakeOver in February. I have no idea. Because there really is nobody for Cross right now to go out there and slaughter. They're just waiting to give him the title. What happens to Balor, I don't know. And then the grizzled young veterans defeated Ever Rise. Ever Rise, listen, I like the makeup of that tag team, but my God, man, do they look like jobbers. They really do look like jobbers. There's no fucking way these guys would last a week on the main roster. None. I like the makeup of the team. They're very good. They are very good at what they do. And the grizzled young veterans are fucking fantastic. Probably one of my favorite tag teams in all the company. Them and Imperium. Awesome stuff there. But NXT was eh. AEW was better than NXT this week. Last week, NXT was better than AEW. I'm not afraid to admit that. But both shows were good this week, AEW being better. Frustration at the WWE Performance Center remains over COVID-19 protocol. According to Fightful Select, there are plenty of frustrated names at the Performance Center right now training. This has reportedly been a tradition since the pandemic started. Trainees are now back at the Performance Center training full-time. They are going five days a week during the pandemic. It's also said that there are some that are only tested once a week and not prior to each training session. Those that Fightful spoken to at the Performance Center say they are typically only COVID-19 tested once a week and trained the rest of the week. WWE had initially been doing virtual classes before a few days a week. The Performance Center was also named on a list of COVID-19 hotspots a strike team, and I know I reported this during the summer, visited the facility, but obviously they were permitted to remain open. That doesn't stop the frustration currently going on that they might not be doing enough to slow the spread of COVID-19. I know there are some there that are upset with the conspiracy theorists, the anti-maskers, the anti-vaxxers, but this is something that you're going to have to deal with. Not everybody's going to want to take the vaccine. Not everybody's for the vaccine. You got immune systems for a reason. If you don't want to take the vaccine, God bless you. It's your choice. You want to go take the vaccine? You want to go inject that in your body? Go ahead. You have every right to do so. But WWE should be training and testing every day. I haven't heard of anything breaking out there as of late, and they should consider themselves lucky. But they want WWE to do more. It's not really a good look for the company. When you got people training there, training in WWE, complaining that they're not doing enough to keep them safe. If WWE is not doing enough, when these people have contracts up, where do you think they're going to go? Are they going to stay with people that don't give a shit about their well-being? Or are they going to go venture off somewhere else where they know they're going to be taken care of? Treat people right and they will give that right back to you. Come on. Raw ratings. Down. As always, Raw ratings are in for the week, 1.819. This is down from 2.128 for Legends Night, which people foolishly touted as a success. I don't know where. You think sub-level ratings is a success for WWE. You may be on another fucking planet, man. I don't know what the fuck you're watching. You may be watching Monday Night Raw from 2003. WWE had to go up against the Ohio State versus Alabama championship game on ESPN, which did 18 million viewers. The college football game did nothing to Monday Night Raw. So don't use the excuse. They were actually up over what their average usually is, which is like a 1.6. So the college football game was no detriment to Monday Night Raw. So stop the narrative. They were up from their normal 1.6, 1.7. So the college football game meant nothing as opposition to WWE. 18 to 49 demos saw hour one 0.62. Hour two was a 0.53. Hour three was a 0.51. The hourly breakdown was as follows. 2.02, 1.8, and 1.63 for the eight to 10 hours. This was a show that hyped the return of Triple H. He kicked off Monday Night Raw to speak about the ill will of Randy Orton towards the legends. And Triple H was only there because Drew McIntyre tested positive and WWE actually addressed this and mentioned the coronavirus by name. Drew McIntyre tested positive. So let's bring back a McMahon. 
Because him being out is going to change the entire complexion of this show. Which it did nothing. Him being out did what? Everybody that was usually on Raw was there and ready to work. And WWE did not use them to work. Drew McIntyre addresses the WWE after positive COVID test. T-Bar defeated Xavier Woods. <clears throat> T-Bag defeated Xavier Woods. Bobby Lashley defeated Matt Riddle in two minutes to retain the U.S. title. Then Matt Riddle turns around and called out MVP, and he beat MVP by DQ because Bobby Lashley put more punishment on Matt Riddle. Buried and then buried again. Keith Lee and Sheamus teamed up against Miz and Morrison. They defeated Miz and Mars and the two clowns. Then they turned around and fought each other. Keith Lee ended up defeating Sheamus in a one-on-one match. Double duty for both Bobby, actually not Bobby, like Matt Riddle, Sheamus, and Keith Lee. Don't know why. Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler defeated Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke. Triple H versus Randy Orton ended with a fireball to Randy Orton's eyeballs which WWE then later said that the injuries received by the fireball to Randy Orton only were minor burns at best. Let me shoot somebody in the eye with a fucking fireball and then have them come around and give me the hospital report as reading minor burns. I'd love to take a fucking fireball to Bruce Pritchard's eyes. If that's the case, I'd make sure he's blinded permanently so that he may not look at a script ever again. Fucking ridiculous. I I laugh. I laugh at the fucking people. You know, some people were respectfully engaging me because I said, I don't want magic with my pro wrestling. I'm fucking 38 years old. I'm going to be 39 next month. I don't want fucking Harry Potter magic with my WWE wrestling. But then people called me out and said, well, JD, you loved the Karrion Cross Keith Lee segment where Karrion Cross signed the contract before their match at TakeOver 30. Keith Lee opened it up and Outshot a fireball in his face. That was different. That was great. And NXT doesn't use this hocus pocus shit all that often. Hardly ever. So when I seen that, I'm like, you know what? That's pretty fucking cool. I like that. I could see that with the vibe of Scarlet, you know, with the tarot cards. She put out tarot cards, pretty much ending the reign of Finn Balor, calling out Finn Balor, TikTok. You know, she looks like a fucking witch. And Karrion Cross looks like Satan himself. So I'm not surprised by that scenario. Alexa Bliss shooting a fucking fireball because she's affiliated with The Fiend. Give me a fucking break. Not only is it lame, but it further proves the fact that Alexa Bliss is the star of this duo and Bray Wyatt is second rate. That's what that proves to me. Now, shouldn't it, shouldn't it have been Bray Wyatt shooting the fireball at Randy Orton? This guy burned down the fucking Wyatt family compound. No, but Alexa Bliss obviously was a part of that storyline. So now she's getting revenge for Bray Wyatt. Is Bray Wyatt too much of a pussy? Does he not know how to wield a magic wand? Spare me the hocus pocus magic in my pro wrestling. Drew McIntyre's positive COVID test. Latest on this, Meltzer talked about this situation during The Observer. He stated that McIntyre does indeed have mild symptoms, although McIntyre says he has no symptoms at all. He says, and I quote, my impression of McIntyre is that he's been pretty safe as far as going anywhere. And as far as how he got it, shit happens. You can go to the grocery store and get it. He tested positive, I believe, on Sunday because everyone has to get tested the day before the show. Tested positive on probably Sunday, so the belief is that he didn't have it last Monday because if he had it last Monday, then he wouldn't be good because obviously he was right next to Hulk Hogan, Jimmy Hart, and the legends. Goldberg, etc., etc. Meltzer also brought McIntyre having a confrontation with Goldberg last week, so those guys, the belief is that they're not in any jeopardy or anything to worry about with them. You never know 100%, but the belief is that when it comes to Drew, he will be back after quarantine. Dave Meltzer also stated that Drew McIntyre's two-week quarantine started in time so that if he is in quarantine, he will be ready for the Royal Rumble. 
He's not going to miss the Royal Rumble. Goldberg is not going to be ousted from another title match because of the coronavirus. Even COVID-19 doesn't want Goldberg challenging for a major title. So Drew McIntyre actually stated that he has no symptoms. He doesn't even know how he got the virus because when he works, he works and he never leaves his home. That's what he publicly stated on his social media. So how did he get it? I don't know. I don't know. He's going to make a full recovery. He'll be at the Royal Rumble. He's going to lose the WWE title. All will be right in the WWE realm. Goldberg will be WWE champion going into WrestleMania. All will be right in the WWE realm. Don't worry about it. He'll be fine. Several Raw stars were backstage. No COVID-related issues, but they weren't used during Raw. Now, McIntyre tested positive, and it was stated that McIntyre was not the only talent that tested positive. There was a SmackDown superstar as well who is on TV in a major storyline that tested positive. So we'll see as of this evening for SmackDown. But Cedric Alexander, Asuka, Shelton Benjamin, Nikki Cross, Humberto! Korea! Humberto. Ricochet. They were all backstage, but they did not appear on the show at all. Now, it was previously reported that superstars who are either currently battling COVID-19 or recovering from the virus, there are a number of superstars who contacted the virus, contracted, contacted, whatever. But hopefully the situation will get better soon and WWE can really put an end to all this. Don't know how many of the roster is planning on getting vaccinated, but I hope all this goes away, man. But if there's no COVID-related issues, right? Cedric was there, Oscar was there, Shelton was there, Nikki Cross was there, Humberto Carrillo was there, Ricochet was there, and it's not COVID-related. They were all there to work. Why weren't they used on the show? Why did we see Sheamus do double duty? Why did we see Keith Lee do double duty? Why did we see Matt Riddle do double duty? Why did we see matches end in relatively quick fashion? It's like a normal week of Raw. They only use COVID as an excuse. It's like a normal week of fucking Raw where they don't know what the fuck they're doing and the script probably changed a thousand fucking times because they freaked out with Drew McIntyre getting COVID. Same old shit every single week, nothing new. But those names were backstage and just not used. Why? Because Bruce and Vince suck at their job. How did Randy Orton and Alexa Bliss pull off this fireball ending to Monday Night Raw? Well, Ringside News has reported that the ending of Raw was actually pre-taped. Bliss throwing a fireball, like she did, took a little extra production value, and they wanted to get it right, going to a pre-taped feed and explaining why Randy Orton's cheek magically healed. You know, very difficult to do. I didn't really catch that, but that's exactly what people pinpointed on social media. You never get by anything. You never get anything by the geeks on social media. So they did a pre-taped feed, and it also explained why Randy Orton's cheek magically healed. It was busted open by Triple H during their brawl around the ring. Blood was on Triple H's head during the melee, but that blood was gone when his sledgehammer caught on fire during this final segment. WWE does have the luxury of pre-taping these things or producing these types of things inside the Thunderdome because it is a closed set. They can't do this, obviously, with a live crowd when they start attending these shows. It was cheesy. It was cheesy. Spare me the hocus pocus in my pro wrestling. Randy Orton versus The Fiend. Randy Orton was actually announced for the Royal Rumble, but apparently that was a red herring. WWE wanted you to think that Randy Orton was going to be in the Royal Rumble, which would then get people talking about Edge possibly being in the Royal Rumble and getting his revenge on Randy Orton in the Royal Rumble. But now that is nothing more than a red herring because Meltzer is reporting that Randy Orton and The Fiend will have a gimmick match as originally planned at the Royal Rumble. Meltzer noted that plans can always change, but this is the direction that they are going. Reports indicated that WWE was planning the second ever Firefly Funhouse match between The Fiend and Randy Orton at the show, but there is now word on those plans having been dropped for yet another gimmick match. It may include fire of sorts. I don't know. Who the fuck knows? Who cares? 
I genuinely do not care about Bray Wyatt and where they're going as far as direction. I will say this, and she only deserves the credit here. She is doing a fantastic job in the role that she's playing, Alexa Bliss. That's it. She's awesome. And who would have thought I've said those words on any podcast or would have said any of those words on any podcast? But it's true. Which goes to the narrative of when it's good and when someone is good, I will say so. And when it's bad and when they suck, I will say so. So if everybody thinking that I am unfair in my criticisms, there you go. Why Ric Flair and Lacey Evans are on TV together. Rounding the news rumors up here before I get the hell out of here. Lacey Evans and Ric Flair, they're together now as a couple on TV. So, Jim Ross, obviously he is AEW's play-by-play guy. He talked about this on his Grilling JR podcast. He said that WWE is looking to have more romance angles. Which is why we've seen Ric Flair and Lacey Evans start their own storyline over the last week or so. Now, Aaliyah Mysterio and Buddy Murphy, they had a romantic relationship that obviously is now dead and buried on SmackDown because none of the Mysterio family has been seen on SmackDown. Aaliyah hasn't been seen. Buddy Murphy disappeared. Dominic has disappeared. We don't know what the fuck's going on there. But they had a romantic angle that seemingly went nowhere. And now Ric Flair and Lacey Evans are in a romantic angle. And who knows why this is happening or where it's going. But apparently, WWE thinks that this is going to get some intrigue and interest from the fan base for Monday Night Raw. This is how they combat the lack of interest in the show. Let's bring back Ric Flair as a regular character and pair him with a blonde who is more than half his age. Great. This comes after it was reported by Meltzer that this is just not a two-week storyline and that WWE now will have Ric Flair as a full-time character on Monday Night Raw. And you know what? After my ranting on Charlotte Flair, she got a victory over, over uh, Charlotte Flair, did Lacey, and she does not look better off for it. It's amazing. It's amazing. This is the same company that beat Rhea Ripley at WrestleMania, but they want to put over Lacey Evans over Charlotte Flair so that they can align her with Ric Flair. It's amazing how anybody has a job in that company and can call themselves a creative writer. I don't get it. If you think that's going to generate more interest for the show, try me. The show sucks with or without Lacey Evans or Ric Flair. And finally, one of the bigger things that happened on Monday Night Raw is that Keith Lee exploded a turnbuckle and a rope fell off its hinges on Raw during that tag team match with The Miz and John Morrison. Meltzer explained why WWE wrote a ring break angle into the Keith Lee Sheamus match against Miz and Morrison. Simply boils down to WWE wanting to keep fans tuned in through the commercial break. The mentality is that before you go to commercial, you need something outrageous to hook people. So they had to have the top rope snap to hook people. But the thing is, by the time it came back to the show and the commercials were done, That spot was already fixed and completely irrelevant. WWE now has a meme and a fucking clip that they could shill on social media, but I guess that's all they care about. Keith Lee is a big guy. We should be seeing more spots like that from him. WWE doesn't need to do that with Keith Lee. They're overcompensating for Keith Lee. You had gold when you brought him up. Now you're just trying to find what works in a very desperate manner to keep people interested in Keith Lee. Here's a fucking clue. Why do you need to break something on Monday Night Raw to keep people interested through the commercial break? Shouldn't they be fucking already interested in what's going on and in the performers on the show? Maybe you wouldn't have to try so fucking hard if that was the case, Bruce. But what the fuck do I know? I'm one of these detrimental fans on social media that loves to bitch and moan about everything. I'm getting the hell out of here, man. Thank you guys so much for joining me on the podcast. If you did enjoy this episode 360, hit that thumbs up. Let me know what you guys think down below. Follow me on Twitter, at JD from NY206. Twitter and Instagram, hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on that bell 
for all notifications. Mouthmasker.com slash OTS. Bonfire.com for all your t-shirts as well. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. And make sure you guys check out Blue Chew. BlueChew.com. Use code JD at checkout for a free sample. Guys, I'm getting out of here. Sunday is my off day. If there's anything late breaking, obviously I'll be back with something, but I'll more than likely see you on Monday for a brand new week of content as we got two weeks left until the Royal Rumble. Again, hit that subscribe button and turn on that bell for notifications. Hit that thumbs up and I'll see you guys right back here on the live stream, the post show for Monday Night Raw right here on Off The Script. Until then, guys, have a great weekend and I'll see you back on Monday for Raw.